This is part one of Spanish painting. The second part, we will focus all on just one artist, Velasquez. This is our timeline. We're still in the same place as we have been in the Italian Baroque period. And here's our historical events uh, for the Baroque period in Spain. You can see I left the Counter-Reformation on there. That is the church's reaction to the Reformation. The Thirty Years' War is still on there, and that's mostly because the Spanish were really involved in this Thirty Years' War. I have the coronation of Philip IV of Spain. He is a very important patron of the arts. I also have the Netherlands assert their independence from Spain, so some of you might not know this, but uh, at one point the Netherlands were a part of Spain. Under the Spanish Habsburg kings, Philip III, Philip IV, and Charles II, Spain was weakening as an empire. Naples and Italy was part of Spain, and it was in a constant state of unrest, and the Netherlands were fighting against the Spanish and eventually gained independence in 1648. And in this time, writers and artists produced great works despite the suffering of agriculture, industry, and trade. And we are in Spain today, so we finally moved to another country. So here's what we're looking at today. Spanish Baroque painting was inspired by Caravaggio, and there is this connection. I think I mentioned it when I talked about Caravaggio because at one point he went down to Naples, and Naples was a part of Spain at the time, so they were able to see the work of Caravaggio. A Spanish Baroque painting has a distinctive Spanish flavor in that the Spanish were militantly Catholic. If there was any country that was having none of this Reformation stuff, it was the Spanish. I mean, they're famous for the Inquisition, which tortured heretics and Jews and Muslims, and they were super Catholic. So we will see that reflected in the works of art. Because they were followers of Caravaggio, they um, embraced naturalism through realism as opposed to classicism like the Caracci brothers. They used scenes of everyday life to convey their Catholic morality. And we're not really going to look at any of those paintings because there's a lot to cover in just a little bit of time, but they were sort of the beginning of genre paintings in which you would just have normal people going about their normal lives. However, uh, there was this morality involved. And one of the reasons that they painted so many of these genre paintings is because people from the Netherlands were in Spain and they were buying paintings from them. And when we get to the Netherlands, we'll talk about why genre paintings or paintings of everyday life were so very popular there. Because of their devotion to Catholicism, they embraced a real kind of a dark side of looking at the world as well. So a lot of the paintings are macabre or dark and a little weird and and we'll see this not just on the baroque but when we look at goya later i mean some of the most terrifying images are from goya who's a spanish painter about 150 years later from this and then the second uh, part of the lecture will be all about velasquez so i'll talk about sort of how spanish painting got to where it was in this first one and then we'll go do like a deep dive on Velázquez in the second part. And Velázquez, just so you know, is basically my favorite painter. So we get to do that early on. So one of the things we're going to look at in Spanish painting is the idea of the pregnant moment, or the scene sort of right before everything either falls apart or comes together. And they seem to have adopted this idea from Caravaggio. And here's what I mean. You have all of these figures um, sitting at a table with Jesus. The figures are reaching out to us. This is classic Caravaggio, where he kind of breaks the picture plane and reaches out to the viewer. The two guys sitting at the table have just been informed that they're eating with Jesus after he was resurrected, which is why the guy in green looks like he's about to stand up and throw his chair back. He's like, whoa? But another sort of uh, dramatic moment is that fruit basket. Remember Mr. Salad and Caravaggio, he liked to do still lifes. But that fruit basket looks like it's defying the law of gravity. It looks like it's it should have fallen off the table by now. And that little moment of precariousness, we will see all through um, Spanish painting. There's this moment where it looks like something is about to fall or bend or turn or cook. And Caravaggio introduces this idea with this uh, fruit basket. So it's like this really I mean... A fruit basket gives you a real big moment of tension in addition to all of the people looking incredulous. 
Another thing is I promised you some Easter eggs in my introduction video, so I'm about to give you one. I circled the shell on that guy's vest, and it represents the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Now, some people in here might have done this already, or uh, at least know about it, but basically during the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance and even up until today, people are still doing this, but you can walk across the Pyrenees Mountains uh, from France and you can uh, end your journey uh, in a town called Santiago de Compostela and it's, it's on the pilgrimage route. We'll talk about pilgrimage more when we talk about the Grand Tour. But I just want to tell you about that shell on his jacket. So it's a scallop shell. And, and so why is he wearing a scallop shell? So there are three myths. They all have to do with St. James or Santiago or someone important to him being unharmed in the ocean and they emerged covered in scallop shells. The way that you showed that you finished this pilgrimage is you would continue on to a, a town called Finisterre or Finisterre or finestere, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, but basically it means the end of the earth, finish and tear. Finish meaning end and tear meaning earth. So you would go to the end of the earth, you would go into the water and you would grab a scallop shell, and then you would have this proof that you went uh, on your pilgrimage to um, Santiago de Compostela. Now also, in, in Santiago de Compostela, they had shops and vendors uh, that would sell these shells, so you didn't have to walk all the way to the ocean but it was just a uh, like a way to finish your pilgrimage so if you wanted to walk to the ocean to get your shell you could but Santiago de Compostela was kind of the end of the line for the pilgrimage so there you go there's your Easter egg of the day there will be plenty more when we get to Velasquez uh, but I put this slide here because I, I wanted you to see this hanging fruit thing because it, it really uh, is influential on uh, the rest of the art that we're going to see today so let's start off with the very strange. Uh, this is a painting by Juan Cotan. It's called Still Life with Game Fowl, Vegetables and Fruits. And Cotan painted these. He was a painter, and then he became a Carthusian monk, and they were vegetarians. I'm not really sure that matters to this. but So he painted a bunch of these, like, all in the same year, and they're really weird. I mean, they, they, they mess with space, but mostly... What I love about them is the precariousness of them. I mean, look at these different vegetables just kind of dangling off of this pantry shelf thing. And it's just fruit and dead birds, but because it kind of breaks the picture plane and it's coming out towards us, they do have a dynamism that you wouldn't see if they were just, you know, a still life and a basket of fruit. Here's another one. I think this one is in your book, actually. This is the still life with quince, cabbage, melon, and cucumber. And what we know about Cotan is that he was fascinated with spatial ambiguity and contemplative sensibility. This is just to say that Spanish painters were uh, experimental, and they were trying out different things. And um, even though there was this devout Catholicism there, even this could be seen as some sort of nod to morality. How is this picture some type of morality lesson? I would say that the austerity of these, the sort of sparseness and the, the focus on maybe just the uncooked parts of these, this in their simplest forms, expresses a monastic denial. In other words, they suffer to show their love of God, and they deny what they're, what they're denying is like this worldly pleasure and richness. And so these very sparse, strangely mathematical and geometrical things that have a little drama and tension are about rejecting all of the pleasures that the world offers and really focusing it on, on your Catholic morality. All right, we go from Cotan and trying to create some sort of story about Catholic morality to a straight-up picture of a martyrdom of a saint. So this is Giuseppe di Ribera. He was called La Spagnoletto. He lived mostly in Spain in um, Naples. And he came into contact with Caravaggio. Uh, and you can see the influences, the tenebrism, that light and dark drama. And if you don't know the story of St. Bartholomew, let me give you a little 
taste of it. So Bartholomew was skinned alive. In fact, in Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Vatican, you see a man holding like a skin suit, and that is supposed to be Bartholomew, although it is also a a self-portrait of Michelangelo. Anyway, this is horrifying. He's about to get all of his skin removed while he's still alive. And what's interesting about this painting is that you see his executioner almost looks like he stopped short because he can he can see like Bartholomew's faith and he his furrowed brow and his partially illuminated face suggests this moment of doubt, like, oh my god, am I really going to kill this man for his beliefs? But am I also going to torture him? It's almost as if the torturer is at that moment where he might be converted to Catholicism. And notice, too, how all of the figures are compressed in this scene. They're all kind of in the foreground. It's like they're all shoved together, and it's this really cramped space. And by putting them so close to the foreground, they're almost the size of us. So if we're standing in front of this, we feel like we are there watching St. Bartholomew being flayed. And again, this is classic counter-reformation stuff. I mean... You include the viewer to make them feel like they are in the fight with you. This is uh, somebody dying for their faith, and the, the Catholic Church wants you to be devout to them. And this guy is dying, and he's looking up at God, and, and he's looking for that's his source of comfort. And so as a viewer, we're supposed to stand in front of this and be moved by this and go, I'm so glad that I am a Catholic. Or, oh man, I was wrong that I left Catholicism. I'm coming back. So 10 years later, Ribera paints this scene again, but this time it's much more sadistic and horrifying because we're now watching the skin being removed while this drunken executioner delightedly is flaying him. And on the, on the ground, there's this classical sculpture, which has been identified as the god Baldach. And in the background, there are two priests and their heads are covered and they're witnessing the torture. Now, This is the story, if you don't know the story, like, intensely of St. Bartholomew, besides that he was flayed. He was in India, I guess. He went as far as India, and he converted an Indian king to Christianity, and then destroyed the temples with all of their gods and idols. And that's that's why there's that head on the the ground there, because that's one of the, the gods that was, the statue that was destroyed. The king's brother was also a king, and he captured Bartholomew and said, that he would convert to Christianity too if Baldak was destroyed, and there you are, Baldak was destroyed. Almost simultaneously, a guard told the king that his god had fallen and was lying in pieces, and the king chose to not convert, and instead had Bartholomew crucified, flayed, and then beheaded. So it wasn't enough to take his skin off and to crucify him, but also you got to cut his head off. So you can see where this is going, right? I mean, if we're if this is for the Counter-Reformation, it's, of course, that reminder that you have to fight and believe. But also, this is, whenever you see these pictures of saints and their torture, it's as if the Catholic Church is saying, don't forget what came before you. This is the price that was paid so that you could freely worship Catholicism. And it's your privilege to be a Catholic because you're not doing this anymore. Now, to be fair... The Spanish Inquisition was horrifying, and they did their own torture, so it's it's a little hypocritical. But the point is, if you are a Catholic or a Protestant that has left Catholicism, this painting is for you. Okay, we'll leave it there, and then the next part of this lecture on Spanish painting will be all about Velázquez, and we will end with the greatest painting that has ever been painted in the history of painting. And that's Las Meninas. And I know you're looking at it and you're going like, come on, it's like a bunch of people and a dog. But I promise you, you will be blown away.